Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. Thank you very much. So thank you, JC, and thank you all for coming today. I figure I'll begin very quickly with an overview of why I got here, not how I flew here, but how I got to this point in research, and then move on to my research that's been happening in Japan over the past year and a half or so. So for me, this research actually began in 2005. My family and I had moved down to New Orleans, Louisiana in July of 2005, and we had six very good weeks in New Orleans until Hurricane Katrina came. And upon the arrival of Hurricane Katrina and the failure of the levees, our home and most homes in New Orleans, 80%, were flooded. Our house had about two and a half meters of water. And in the time that followed, since I had no work at that point and no school for my kids, I had a lot of time to think about this question of resilience. What does it mean to bounce back after a disaster? And Rick Wheel and I began putting together the data you see on the board right now. And this is a map of New Orleans. Of course, it's got geographical information. At the north, we have Lake Pontchartrain. At the south, that blue is the Oxbow River of the Mississippi. We also have individual interviews that we did with around 1,000 people across the city. And for every vertical door we could find, we knocked on the door several times. And if someone came to the door, we asked them a lot of questions. One of them was, on a scale of one to five, how has recovery gone to you? One was a red dot, three, as you can see, was yellow, and five was green. And then we overlaid those dots with a map of how deep the water was in each of these locations. And you can see at the bottom of the map, this is the highest ground. The whitish areas have less than half a meter of water. The yellow areas are about a meter and a half to two meters. Light blue around two meters and dark blue around three meters. You guys are all smart people. Tell me what pattern do you see connecting the depth of water in people's homes with the reported recovery levels? None? Not much. So I expected that we'd find the darker blue areas would all be red and orange, and the lighter white and yellow areas would all be green, or at least orange. But the reality is that wasn't the case. In fact, if you look closely, there are huge clusters of people up in the northeast quadrant there. Everyone that we talked to was basically a green, a solid five, even though they had over two and a half meters of water in their homes. In contrast, we had a number of families even in very, very, what we consider to be light damage areas, that told us that things were not going very well for them. So let me ask another question. If someone said to you, based on this map, taken about a year and a half after the disaster, how is New Orleans recovering from disaster? What would you tell them? Debatable if there's recovery? I think it's the wrong question to ask. I think if someone asks you, how is Christchurch doing, or how is New Orleans doing after a disaster, that's the wrong question. Because recovery is not a city level phenomenon. Recovery is a house by house, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood kind of process. And that's exactly what drove the book that we just already talked about called Building Resilience. And that book takes four mega disasters each of which killed at least a thousand people and had over a billion dollars in damage, and traces at the micro level, at the zip code level, or the block level, or the census level, how did recovery go? That's how I got to where I am today. Now, I want to talk about three and a half years, almost four and a half years ago now, the March 11th, 2011 disaster in Japan. I'm sure you all know that on that day, around 2.45 p.m., on a Friday afternoon, as kids were getting out of school, there was a massive 9.0 earthquake off Japan's shore. Now, 9.0 was powerful enough from outer space, if you're watching the Earth, the Earth would have jumped for that moment. 9.0. And that earthquake itself did not do much damage to the cities and buildings on shore, like you guys in New Zealand, very good building codes there. 
But what happened was several massive tsunami as high as 20 meters were created. They rushed ashore around 40 miles per hour, and those took over 20,000 lives along the coast. I don't have time today to talk about what happened at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. That's a separate book, but that's perhaps a conversation to have afterwards over, over grapes. But more importantly for me is this question of the tsunami and what happened. Now you've all seen images like this. This image actually is quite misleading because the bump that you see the water pouring over, that's a nine meter seawall. That's a nine meter seawall that's being overtopped right now. And if you could look back on our left here, inland, there are houses less than 15 meters away. So we had 20,000 casualties from this tsunami on March 11th. But the interesting thing for us was that the distribution of deaths across those coastal communities was very uneven. In some communities, we had no deaths whatsoever. In others, we had 1%, 2%, 5%, 9%. In some communities, one in 10 people, one in nine people were killed by the tsunami. So as a social scientist and a resident of a coastal community, I wanted to know why was it that some communities had no deaths and others lost a tenth of the population to that disaster? By the way, what might explain that? What might drive mortality during a tsunami? Readiness. Okay, so we'd like to imagine that if we have more drills, more practice sessions, better warning systems, things would be better. Great, so you have markers up in the hills at the shrines that show you how far you should have built. But of course, most of these communities built well beneath those markers. So from policy set to local authorities? Good, so maybe local, some local communities have better preparation, better training, better broadcasting systems. Good, fishermen are more likely to be on the coast, canning jobs involved in fishing also closer, people in school further away. How about a few geographers in the room? What might determine tsunami mortality rates? How about how tall the tsunami was? Right? In each village, that height was quite different. So we began with this question, well, maybe it's something very simple. Maybe it's a question of how powerful that disaster was when it came ashore. So this X axis, the bottom axis here, this is how tall the tsunami was, between zero and 20 meters. And the Y axis, the vertical axis, that's the proportion of people living in that town that were killed by the tsunami. Now, you guys are all smart. If there were a perfect relationship between tsunami height and mortality, what kind of line would we see? Like a 45 degree line, right? We kind of see that, right? You can see the hints of that. But we also have lots of outliers. Let's take a few examples. The village of Tanohata had a 19 meter tsunami. That's what, six stories? But only 2% of the population there was killed. In contrast, in Higashima Tsushima, right above my hand here, they only had a three meter tsunami. The same proportion of people were killed there. Look up to Onagawa, because in Takata, Otsuchi, those communities had relatively short tsunamis, only around 13 meters. Those communities lost 11% of the population. And look at Rifu and Natori. These communities only had three meter tsunamis, but they lost also a tenth of the population. So we can see there's some connection, perhaps, between the physical strength of the event and mortality, but that's not the whole story. So what might explain differences in mortality among these communities? I was very lucky, I had a year in Japan over the last year and a half to ask this question of people who live in these communities. And they really have five different theories. Now, the first theory we see already comes from this question of how tall the tsunami was. We discussed that already. But if you're a cynic like me, or a political scientist, you can imagine that somehow maybe politics could play a role. How could politics play a role in mortality? Well, you could imagine that perhaps if your community on the coast supported the long ruling LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, maybe sometime over time you'd be giving more money or more support for those kind of training programs, better warning systems. They could be. And my friends at Purdue, where I used to teach, they're mostly engineers, and they by and large lack imagination. So in their perspective, what really matters isn't politics or the height of the wave. 
What really matters is how much concrete did you pour between your village and the ocean? So they would say, look, it doesn't matter about politics. What matters is, was it a 10 meter tsunami and a 15 meter protective wall? Was it a five meter tsunami and a two meter wave? What really matters there is protection. How much concrete was there? How tall were these sea walls? My friends who are de demographers though say what really matters is demographics. People who are elderly or very, very young, they're the most vulnerable populations. We know this from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. People who are older or younger tended to die at higher rates. So what they would say was the village makeup really matters. Is it an older village or a younger one? I want to slip in one possible theory that I'm partial to myself. And this is the concept of social capital. Social capital is a very fancy way of saying the ties that connect us to other people. And there are different types of ties. We have what we call bonding, bridging, and linking ties. Bonding ties connect people who are quite similar. So for example, if you're a middle-aged white person teaching it here in Auckland, probably most of your friends are middle-aged white people in Auckland. Now, if in contrast, you're a Patinavar fishing cast member in Tamil Nadu in India, probably most of your friends are also fishermen there in India. That's a bonding social capital. It means people who are similar tend to glom together. But we also have something called bridging social capital. Bridging social capital connects people who are different, but they share an interest. They share an institution. Maybe your kids go to the same public school or the same kindergarten. Maybe you like bocce ball or opera. Maybe you work for the same institution, the same company. Through those kind of bridging connections, you might form a tie beyond ethnicity, race, religion, and so forth. The final type of connection is vertical. Linking social capital connects you or me as normal people to someone in positions of authority or power. Maybe in America you know the mayor of a city or FEMA or Red Cross. Maybe here in New Zealand you know the prime minister's office or someone in the mayor's office. How might those social ties save lives during a disaster? We know that between the shaking of the ground and the arrival of the tsunami, people had 40 minutes on average, four zero minutes, to get out of their homes and businesses and go to higher ground. Now, 40 minutes is plenty of time if you're young and able-bodied. But if you're elderly, if you're infirm, if you're in a bed or a hospital, 40 minutes wasn't enough time. In the interviews that we did, people often told us, do you know who saved our lives? It was our neighbors, our friends, family members who came to get us. Now, the interesting thing in Japan is that goes against their training. The training in Japan is called Tendenko, which means get out by yourself. If you stop and knock on someone's door and say, Mrs. Smith, it's, well, Mrs. Tanaka, it's time to go, and you help them get out of that building, then you're going against the training that you got as a child. Now, everyone that we talked to over the age of 65 said they had someone helping them. We call this informal insurance or mutual aid. Now, in order for you to go help someone else, you have to have three things. One, you've got to know that there is someone else to help. If you don't know you have a neighbor or never met them before, you're not going to knock on their door. Two, you've got to actually take your own life at risk to do so. You have some kind of connection to them. And three, you have to want to help them because getting them up into a house, from a house into a chair, chair into a, a building or into a van, takes a lot of time and effort. So to invest that kind of moment when your own life is at risk, requires some kind of connections. So those bonding and bridging connections might make a big difference as that wave is approaching the shore. The other thing is, in many of the villages we talked to, it wasn't just one person going door to door, one friend or one caregiver. Oftentimes, they formed a committee of people. You get Mr. Tanaka, I'll come help you. They'll, they'll go get Mr. Wakabayashi. That is, they formed groups of individuals who would work together. We call this collective action. Collective action is pretty hard when you know that there's a possible tsunami arriving. You have to have some kind of emotional or, or spiritual connection to someone else. You need to have those bonds in place. So it's possible if you have these kind of horizontal bonds, collective action and also informal insurance, maybe that will save some lives. Let's see which of these theories works pretty well. Now, we collected data on a number of different factors in these 140 communities along the coast. For example, how high was the tsunami? How high was the wall itself? How population dense was the area? What kind of support was there for that political party we mentioned before? What kind of spending was there on disaster? How exposed were they to the coast? Let me just ask you, by the way, what factors do you think are going to matter of these factors? What will determine mortality in these communities? Demographics? Okay, so the age of the people? 
single family households, so people who don't have those connections nearby. Any other thoughts what might determine mortality? Okay, let's find out. So this is the eye test. If you can read this, you don't need glasses. This is basically just to try to show that we took very seriously the concept that there are different ways to analyze the data. So we ran five different types of models. If you're, if you're quantum, I'll tell you right now, OLS regression doesn't capture a bounded de dependent variable, right? It's between zero and 100. We had to use other methods, non-linear methods, like a GLM, which is a linear, non-linear model, a better inflation, and a toy bit. These are all different ways of capturing this question of what happens. But what's important is, in all the models that we ran, only two factors were important in all of them. The first was how tall that tsunami was. We mentioned before the very first slide, this question of height. Now, it's a pretty straightforward relationship. In a community that had no tsunami whatsoever, holding everything else constant, we expect no casualties. And as the tsunami height rises, we expect it to rise perhaps to a maximum of around 5 or 6%. The solid black line is a prediction, and the blue space is the confidence interval around how sure are we of those predictions. What wasn't so, in, what wasn't so intuitive to us, though, was that our measurement of social cohesion, our measurement of social capital, also played a difference in saving lives. So in, in, envision the average community along the coast in Japan that has the average demographics, the average population density, and so forth. In a community where there were no crimes being committed, where we think social cohesion is high, people get along, there's high norms of reciprocity and trust. In that community, this tsunami would cause no deaths, maybe one in a thousand at most. As that community's bonds break down, as crime rises, as we lose reciprocity and these norms, we go from having one in a thousand deaths to two in a hundred deaths, holding everything else constant. So a very strong predictor in these communities, at least for our data, was the cohesion, the social capital that was present before the disaster itself. That's the first stage. This is the question of mortality. What happens then in the four years since that moment? What's happened in terms of recovery? This is from Ishinomaki, if you've been there. This is one of the downtown Motomachi cities. This is the exact same angle. We tried to get it. If you notice, the same pole is there. So we've taken out all the debris, all the rubble, all the refrigerators and the, and the cars. They're all gone. Of course, the question is, are people occupying those stores and schools and shops there nearby? Even in Sendai, we've seen progress. Okay, so the white car is still there. I don't know why. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you why. <laughs> I think it's a memorial at this point. I didn't ask the farmer what's going on, but that same car is there. Slightly moved, but in any case, they're actually farming now in parts of Sendai, where there was saltwater intrusion four and a half years ago. So there has been a physical progress in getting a debris off the ground. The problem for us was, how do you measure recovery after a massive disaster like this? When in some communities, everything is shut down. There's no schools, there's no gas lines, there's no electricity, there's no housing. In other communities, they're doing pretty well. So rather than answering that question of what is recovery, we built one index on a scale of zero to 100. Zero meant nothing was operating. No schools, no convenience scores, no local homes were occupied, and so forth. 100 meant everything was running perfectly as it was beforehand. We have all kinds of stuff in here. We have questions about roads, we have infrastructure lines, debris pickup, and so forth. And what we expect to find is that there'll be some distribution of this recovery index over time. And we could measure also all kinds of factors, like we did in the first case. For example, how much capacity did this each city hold immediately following the, the disaster? A minimum of 13% to around 60%. Then uh, two years later, proportion of dead, town area, the disaster activity spending, support for the LDP, powerful politicians, population density, and that measure of crime again. By the way, in the recovery factors, what do you think will be important now? What will drive recovery? If social capital, these horizontal bonds, drove mortality, what will drive recovery? Please. Interesting. So now we're getting cynical. You know, maybe it's no longer about those horizontal ties, but maybe the vertical ones. Good. Could be politics. What else could be driving the recovery process? Financial ability. So how independent? This is a measure of independence. How independent is each local community from the central government? In Japan, the central government provides roughly two thirds of all the money being spent at local governments. More independent you are, maybe you have more flexibility. So again, the eye test, well actually we can talk about distribution first. So here, two years later, after the March 11th disaster, we have two clusters of cities. 
Some are hovering around 50% of recovery, half of schools, half of houses, half of roads open again. But in other cases, everyone's reopened again. 100% means they have full recovery of all those factors, schools, businesses, roads, and so forth. And we can actually see change over time, like this. Now we're looking at two time scales at the same moment. The bottom axis, the x-axis, is immediately following the tsunami. What kind of capacity was there? We see some as low as 16% capacity, meaning everything is shut down, no schools are open, no businesses are open, no roads are open, all the way to Iwaizumi, 60% meaning we have most of things, two-thirds of schools are open, two-thirds of roads. The y-axis is two years later, how are things going? How did that individual village move? And by the way, you tell me, what clusters do we see? Who's doing really well? Who had a really hard beginning point and bounced back? Yamada, very good. So if you look at Yamada, the dot above my hand here, they began at around 16%, meaning almost everything was shut down. And two years later, they're at 80%. That's a fantastic shine of resilience there. Good. Who is kind of a laggard for recovery? Who's not doing so well? There's more than one of them, right? Where's the cluster of laggards in this scale? Yeah. This area here, right above my hand. These guys are kind of laggards, right? They had a lot of damage, 30 to 40% capacity initially, but they're stuck right at around two-thirds, now two years later. Good. And who did really well? Who's completely back to full capacity? Right? Rifu Fudai, right? Up at the top there. So let's figure out. Again, we have the eye test, but again, what matters here is the interesting following. Of all the factors that drive recovery, only one was consistently important political connections. In a community that has, on average, the typical number of d demographic levels, the typical number of support, we expect them to only be at around three quarters recovery two years later. But if that community had a number of powerful politicians, individuals who in the center could pull those levers of power, distribute money, talk to their friends in the construction business, get things moving again, smooth the permitting way, then they'd actually do better. We predict that with a number of politicians, they would actually recover better than they had before. They'd be building more schools, more roads, more businesses, thanks to the support from the center. And this is holding everything else constant. So there was no impact from demographics, for example. There was no impact from horizontal social capital either in this case. Okay. If this is the case, right, we have now mortality and recovery information, what should we be doing about it? in communities that are vulnerable, whether it's Auckland or Christchurch or in Japan's case, Tohoku. So we have a few different programs that we're trying out. Some of them we're trying out in North America, some are trying out in Japan. You might recognize the man in the red sweater. Who is that man in the red sweater, by the way? Mr. Fred Rogers, now deceased, unfortunately. When I was a kid in America, he was my favorite babysitter. Right? Every morning he'd wake up and ask me to be a good neighbor. So what we found is in many urban centers, people don't know their neighbors at all. If I ask you guys right now, who can name nine neighbors' last names? I see two or three hands going up. Okay, how about five neighbors' last names? Oh, a few hands, that's good. Okay, maybe not so many neighbors' last names? That, okay. So, you can see, right, even in this room, and I'm assuming most of us, for example, aren't struggling on a daily basis to find a house to live in and that kind of stuff, right? So we have pretty set standards right now as middle-class people here in New Zealand. It's hard for us. So what we found is, all across Japan and America as well, most of us in urban centers don't know our neighbors. But those neighbors are the first responders. If there's an earthquake or a tsunami, it will be days before civil defense get here. It will be days or weeks before food arrives. Right? In New Orleans, for example, it was two weeks before people had food and water from the central government. Two weeks. So in that meantime, what are you doing to survive? It's your friends, it's your neighbors, people who live nearby. So what we're doing in these communities is encouraging people to get to know their neighbors. Get out there. Get to know them. They need a wheelchair if something goes wrong. Do they have a pet? Do they have diabetes medicines? What things do they need to survive? That's the first stage. The next image over from Mr. Rogers comes from Indiana, where I used to live. So this is kind of a slow party for you guys, perhaps. This is an image of a block party. A block party means you close off the street to traffic. You bring in your barbecue. You bring out your soccer ball or your football, whatever you guys call it here. And you do those things that have, have, you, know, you relax with. So a block party is a way of building those bonding and bridging at a larger scale. Not just your neighbors now, but the whole community. 
Now in Japan, it could be a matsuri, it could be a festival. Maybe in India, it might be a wedding or, or a funeral. Here in, in, in New Zealand, maybe it'll be a soccer game or some kind of outdoor festival. Whatever the local connections you build through a thing, that's what you want to do. So individual connections first, neighbors, and then a broader neighborhood after that. That third image is, comes from the questions of urban design and city planning. We know that the physical structure, the physical layout of our lives, strongly determines the kind of connections that we have. For many of us living in large-scale high-rises, for example, the reason that we don't know our neighbors is because we have no shared space. Right? Maybe you see them when you're getting the garbage outside or picking up your mail, right? But we can design better locations that encourage interaction. This means we design houses, for example, with on-street parking, no garages underground. Why? Because when you come home at the end of the day with your bag of groceries and you drive into your driveway and the garage door closes, you see nobody. But if you park on the street and you walk in and there's someone sitting on the porch, you go, hi, Mrs. Smith, how are things? You have that conversation, right? Or your kids play outside in the street. Those shared play spaces, those shared eating and talking spaces, that's how we can build connections, even in urban centers. So right now in Japan, we're designing even the areas for short-term housing for survivors with this concept of interactions in mind. By the way, some people go even further. They build shared cooperative housing. If you have a shared kitchen, for example, you have private sleeping spaces, but shared living spaces. Two more approaches we're tying. The bottom left here is what we call the focus group approach. Some of my colleagues back in the late 1990s began going around the world and seeing, is it possible to build trust and connections through regular meetings? What we found is the following. If you call people together and you have a meeting on any topic, it could be women's rights, it could be HIV AIDS, it could be the environment, and they meet regularly on this topic for two or three hours a week for about three months, you build up the sense and only of trust in the group, but a trust in society, in belief in what's happening, because you think people also care about these issues. People want to work with me, we can work together. So these kind of focus groups can build and increase trust by 15% over a three to four month period. A regular meeting, it could be zoning, it could be discussions of long-term planning, it could even be disaster recovery planning. Whatever the meeting is about, this is one way of deliberately building these kind of connections in the community. One more approach, for those of you from Canada, don't worry, this is not a counterfeit dollar. This is a real fake dollar, or it's a real Toronto dollar. We call this community currency, or time banking. By the way, if you're from Littleton, here in New Zealand, they actually have a very strong program already. It's a very, very simple idea. Most of us nowadays want to volunteer. We want to do more. But we feel it's a trade-off with our job, with our income, and so forth. So what we do is we offer you an incentive. If you volunteer at an old folks' home, at a school, at a local dog shelter, we'll give you five Toronto dollars or five Auckland dollars. Now that five dollars cannot be spent at McDonald's or some large chain. It can only be spent at local mom and pop stores, a farmer's market, a local cafe, a barber shop. So what happens? We're encouraging you to get out more often, and you do. And you spend this capital at a local store. The store now has the money. What does the store do? They have to go to other stores nearby. So that store now builds connections to other stores, and we build a virtuous cycle. What we found is introducing this kind of pr 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 uh, plan in urban centers increases interaction and trust by 17% on average. It changes people's lives by getting them out of their homes, getting them to volunteer. Two more things that we're working on right now, by the way, in Japan. One is an actual site in Ibasho where we're trying to actually measure what happens to people in these kind of programs. We just published our first uh, World Bank paper about two weeks ago. It's out there on the web if you want to find it. It's called Elders Lead the Way. And the idea is very simple. We believe that you can design a space that will bring in the young, the middle aged, and the old, and they'll build those connections through things like a cafe, a library, a homework corner, a school area. What we're doing is deliberately building these bonds and measuring changes over time. We're also following a group of evacuees from Fukushima. It's been almost four and a half years now. Some of them may never go back to their homes. But we're seeing to what degree do social connections and social capital ameliorate the negative impact of anxiety about radiation and anxiety about the future. We have a paper coming out, hopefully, from The Lancet pretty soon. Okay, what are some broader things to talk about? So first of all, I've argued today that both during the mortality phase, that is, during the event itself, and in the recovery phase, physical infrastructure by itself, the seawall height, had no measurable impact. But the vast majority of spending that we do around the world, whether it's in Japan or New Zealand or America, 
is on physical infrastructure changes, upgrading buildings, building stronger bridges and seawalls and so forth. But the reality is, I'm going to argue, that what has been driving the processes of resilience have come from social connections and social infrastructure. The challenge for us is to convince decision makers to think, what can they do in their community? What local programs will fit into their city that will help advance these kind of social connections? Now, I've also argued that we can capture these kind of connections, just like we capture per capita GDP or quality of life, also very vague concepts, you know, are you wealthy? Are you happy? We can capture those quantitatively. We can also capture these questions of connections as well. If that's true, then we can measure what kind of changes do our programs have on those attributes. And finally, I'm gonna argue that our job then, as both scholars and residents, is to think through what are we doing in our community in the long and the short term to ensure that when that big disaster comes, we've built up those connections to neighbors, built up those connections to NGOs and to nonprofit groups, and also work to build more broadly social resilience. Thank you very much. countries where it still struggles to actually uh, spread out. So it's a very compelling argument. So now, now we've got heaps of time to actually uh, entertain questions and debate if you want, uh, but an hour. So the floor is yours now for uh, questions, comments, suggestions. I don't think the mic is... That's a good question. We didn't find any threshold moment where being too dense or being less dense made a difference, at least in these two measures. S some have argued, HAQ, H-A-Q-U-E, has argued, in fact, that there is a sweet spot, right? That you have a certain density in terms of interactions. What I think is happening is that in the very, very urban areas, because the connections are relatively weak, in contrast to very, really, let's say, sparse areas in rural areas, where there's more density, I think you have sort of a trade-off there. That there's no sweet spot because there's negatives on both sides. Farmers and fishermen in these communities may have better ties, but there are few of them in connections, in contrast to, let's say, white-collar workers in a city who have fewer ties, but there are many more of them. So we didn't really find that interaction happening. I think it would be an interesting project to investigate, you know, are there differences in rural and urban? We, we thought we'd find, for example, that the, ur ur the urban areas would be completely unconnected. That wasn't the case. There, there was variation even in a city itself, neighborhood by neighborhood. So one neighborhood may be really lively and exciting and going on, and other neighborhood may be People are shutting down, going inside their homes. There's more crime, they don't go out as much. They're afraid to go out after dark, those kind of two different areas. So I think there's variation even in an urban area, which probably is much more dense than the typical rural ones. Please. Um, I'm curious about the Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina really changed what I was doing. Actually, my first book project was on nuclear power in Japan. And uh, I mentioned in that very first slide, it's one of those weird things that happens to people over their career. So my very first field work in Japan back in the early 2000s, I spent about a year and a half in the field in Japan in the city that had the nuclear meltdowns, actually. And these, these cities are called Futaba and Okuma. So back in 2001 and 2002, I spent a year there doing research on nuclear power in Japan. So this project right now has brought together, unfortunately, my first strand of research and this one, which was to what degree do the social connections make a difference in the process of recovery. Um, and of course, you can imagine that the people that I knew in Futaba, they've all left. Those cities are now no-go zones uh, for pretty much anyone. So it's changed a lot, but it's been uh, a tragic way to sort of see what's happening to a village that had nuclear power and then it went wrong. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, I guess two questions. One is, uh, I was interested that you mentioned social cohesion and social capital, almost a sort of synonymous term. I'm just curious as to if you think they are similar or the same thing. Yeah. And secondly, uh, what I appreciated about the, the presentation was a focus of resilience moving beyond just physical infrastructure. We just need more concrete. Buildings need to be that much stronger. We need better sort of evacuation, you know, better roads, that sort of thing, to sort of focusing on... Um, on social relationships and ties and, and, and linkages. Um, and so that to me sort of speaks to the importance of community development. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of moves recovery from that sort of the end of the disaster cycle to something that sort of actually encompasses the entire. You know, recovery actually happens even before the event happens. Right. 
Um, and so what I'm wondering about is the one thing that I didn't hear you, you sort of hinted to was that there are these different levels of bonding, bridging, and linking capital. But where does oppression and marginalization and greater vulnerabilities fit within all of that? Right. Yeah, these are great questions. So let's talk about the second one first because that's, I think, harder to answer. So this, this is a very good point, which is that bonding social capital, the connections in a group, have a negative side, right? So if you're the in-group, right, if your group is the one with resources and you're in control of society, or at least this part of society, it's very easy to push out those who are different. And this, for example, happened when I was doing work in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, there, the backwards castes, as they're called, the Dalits, were often excluded from the lists of recovery from these areas along the coast of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and also we saw this in Japan in the 1920s. People who were Korean, for example, were off the list, actually physically targeted for attack by mobs following the disasters there. So in, in, this, in these disasters, in Japan at least, it's more challenging to find the in-group, out-group levels, because in those two examples of the Dalit and the Barakam and the Koreans in Japan, it was obvious to in-group, out-group differences. Here it's a little bit harder, right? Because you have far fewer racial minorities, for example, and far few, fewer class in Japan. Certainly in these cases as well, I would say, that there's going to be a dark side to too much bonding social capital. And maybe actually the sweet spot is not necessarily the density question, but the question about bridging and bonding. Right? And what we found in India, for example, and this is Ashtash Varshni's work, has been there's some kind of moment when you have good internal cohesion to your group, but you also have mohala, or peace committees, that connect you to the other group. This is primarily, for example, among the, uh, the Hindu and Muslim communities that are in places like Gujarat where you had riots for a period of time in the 1990s, but that was solved internally and through bridging connections. So I think that's a fantastic research. It's hard to do in this context of the Toku disaster, primarily because it's harder to see those differences. But I, I, th I certainly think in America, for example, we certainly have racial and class differences. We saw that in Hurricane Katrina as well. And of course, we have different institutional responses to those groups as well. So you're right, I think there are, there are complex layers we have to add in societies that have that more heterogeneity, which Japan does not right now. Your first question was about social cohesion, right? So I tend to use them relatively interchangeably, primarily because if I say social capital over and over again, it gets boring for me. <laughs> but certainly, you know, there, there are those who would say cohesion and capital are not the same thing, right? And for example, in America, there are measures of cohesion that are actually racial indexes, for example, uh, that is the heterogeneity, heterogeneity indexes. So I, I'm relatively uh, in the middle of the road on this question. You know, I, I think you could use them relatively interchangeably, uh, certainly for bonding social capital, at least. We could talk about that as, as a cohesion measure. Um, maybe not so much bridging and linking right there. You might have some big differences. Maybe your friend in the mayor's office only responds to her texts once a week kind of thing. So that's a good point. Um, but I, again, I think it's, it's important to see cohesion in these texts means that when you look for the reciprocity and norms, they're present already. Right? So in neighbors, for example, I think we could call that cohesion pretty well the ability to rely on expectations of behavior and to have this followed through. If I knock on your door, you're gonna answer and give me something to help. You know my name already beforehand, we've exchanged gifts beforehand. So I think in those local contexts where geography is, is circumscribing the connections, we could talk about cohesion and social capital as overlapping. Good to follow up question to this one. How do you respond to the criticism by some that the word capital actually reflects some sort of accumulation of things, whatever it is, right. rather than showing that it's as well a matter of diversity of networks, a matter of strength of the networks. It's, a, it's, it's much more complicated than that. So. Yeah, this is the, the Burdu and Lin argument. So Burdu has long argued, right, that social capital really reflects, for example, reputation and class and, and wealth. And Lin has said, no, no, this is really about the network itself. It can be orthogonal to those questions. I'm more optimistic on social capital's role. Uh, I, I see myself as more of the Tok Tocqueville approach from Putnam. That is, often you can build these connections regardless of class. In fact, I should go back to the very first slide. I forgot to mention this example. In New Orleans, the first questions that we had actually about recovery were about race and class. And the questions were, look, you know, all these clusters of survival, all these individuals who had more money beforehand, right? And the funny thing was, actually, they were not. So if you look again in that cluster of green dots up in the Northeast, this area is called Village de l'Est or MQVN, the Mary Queen of Vietnam neighborhood. They were mostly Vietnamese and Vietnamese immigrants who lived there. Uh, now we have around 600 families there. That families, those average income were at $13,000 less than the American average, which is pretty low to begin with. And levels of education were less than high school because many of the elders there had no college education whatsoever, didn't even finish primary school in the country of origin when they came from Vietnam. This community though, in terms of bonding social capital and linking were off the charts. 
Right? There are levels of cohesion. Can you name neighbors' last names? How often do you go outside of your house? Do you trust your neighbors? Do you leave your doors unlocked? All the measures that we can use to sort of survey local connections, they did really, really well. And by the way, I should point out that in terms of recovery, one year later, they had 90% population recovery and 90% business recovery. My old neighborhood of Lakeview, which is primarily white and upper middle class, in terms of measurements of social capital bonding, very, very low. So we couldn't name last names, we don't go to parties that much. They had very good bridging social capital, though. I think this is an interesting point to talk about a little bit more, which is, what is, is there a, a zero-sum game between bonding, bridging, and linking? Is it possible, for example, to have a community that's internally cohesive, at the same time connected to other communities, and connected vertically? I think we haven't seen in real life many good examples of that kind of trifecta. You have all three. What we've seen more often, at least in the American context, has been communities that are really well connected internally, like Village de l'Est, or really well externally connected, like my old community. But no one that has both the internal and the bridging and linking ties at the same time. And I think this is the frontier, at least for my work, will be in the future, trying to figure out, you know, therefore, are there things we should be building? Should we build linking before bonding? Should we ensure cohesion first before we go to bridging? I'm not sure I have the answers to those questions, but I think we have not seen in the American context a good distrib distribution of those. But those don't connect very well to race, though, uh, to race or to a class in that case. Right? In, in these cases, we were able to find very high levels of social capital, regardless of levels of, for example, of reputation or background in class. Oh, sorry, you said you, yeah, please. Um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. I, uh, I'd sort of like to comment that the, what, what you're talking about has been sort of discussed in similar contexts across, as you know, across urban design forums, across um, you know, other environmental sustainability, that the same concept around building social cohesion. I mean, I don't know how many people went to Charles Montgomery and where his, his book, Happy City. Mm -hmm. so he's just been out, and it pretty much the exact same thing around we need to build social ties in, huh. in the, to the end of building better cities. Huh. And um, I guess... Uh, it's something that's very difficult, and we're struggling with that in Auckland. Um, and I wonder how much of your words looked at what are the, the root causes of those things. Yes, we can talk about building bondage, uh, building better bonds, linkages, etc. But what are those root causes that are, are, are not enabling it to happen? Right. And what are the roles of local government and or central government in that response? But in, in our context in Auckland, I think it's the relationship between communities and local government is, is kind of is broken. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these reasons why that might be, but you know, what are those root causes that will enable this to happen? Sure, so I mean, it's not my research, but other people have. And I think two big factors are institutions and history. So Putnam has argued for a long time that there's a feedback cycle, that as communities get better connected, the governance, the responsiveness for politicians improves, and that in turn improves, improves your expectations of governance and people get more motivated. So he calls this the virtuous cycle of governance. So that, for example, if you've had a bad experience in the past where you, people have been unresponsive, so that you call the government up a, pot, a pothole or about crime or someone's driving through the neighborhood at night, whatever, loudly, and they don't respond, then you don't vote as much in the next election. You don't get politically involved. And then because you're not sort of having control over decision making, then decision making gets worse. And you have this negative cycle, actually. So this is what Putnam talks about, the institutional feedback. That if there isn't a strong community to begin with there that provides feedback, then governance actually drives people away. We saw this in Detroit for many years, a lot of mismanagement for the, for, from both federal and local levels in Detroit on school questions, on investments, on roads and infrastructure. What you saw was people began to leave the city because they thought they weren't being listened to or take, taken seriously as citizens. The goals of businesses were going first, and that really drove people out. The other thing I think you, you can see is history. So we have some good case studies from Japan, communities that have worked together on issues unrelated to dis disaster resilience, unrelated to social capital, questions, for example, like environmental cleanup, uh, questions like social activism on, on voting rights or women's rights, they formed a sort of a threshold connection initially on some topic, and that sustained the community in other areas. Those were the communities over time that became the leaders, the ones who pushed really hard. The individuals were out there pushing for changes. Those communities where they didn't really have that history, you didn't see so much developing. So I think both those questions, institutional feedback and also history, play a really big role in neighborhoods. One, one more thing to add, and Putnam's done this research recently, he argues that very heterogeneous areas, so areas with mixed races, those areas actually have less social capital than areas that are more homogenous. 
And he argues it's because we fear the other. We're not quite sure what to do in these contexts. We don't know the, the cues, which, how I'll be taken, I'll be taken seriously, I'll be laughed at, I'll get mugged, or whatever. So we tend to pull back. So we volunteer less, we leave our homes less, we give less blood, we, we vote less. And then again, we have the negative cycle where I don't go out as much. Maybe a gang takes over nearby or bad governance takes over nearby. And then that pushes me further inside. So, so Putnam says this is kind of a cycle in these cases. We have this interaction between choices made by individuals, but institutional outcomes as well. Sociologists have often argued for a long time that home ownership, high levels of home ownership connect with high levels of bonding social capital because it connects to a sense of place and obligation. So if I own a home in a neighborhood, I really want it to look good. I'll pick up trash nearby. I'll shoo away vagrants. I'll make sure that uh, kids aren't throwing eggs at homes. I'll go on community patrols. I'll vote more often. If I'm a student there for one year on a contract, maybe I don't care so much about the garbage in my backyard or if kids are acting badly at night or someone throwing up on my front lawn. So, so sociologists have long connected this idea of home ownership to stability in communities and therefore to participation. Please. Daniel, based on your experience in research, what is the smart way to invest? Is it community groups to develop the networks and the social? Uh, is it public education? Mm. Is it infrastructure or warning systems? Where would you the smart money? Yeah, I mean, I think the bias right now is toward the infrastructure systems, toward upgrades of buildings, toward things like uh, better earthquake and fireproof areas. I think the money that should be spent should be spent on small bottom-up projects, whatever the community itself uses. And this is, this is the fuzzy area. It's really hard to prescribe one single silver bullet because the way to build social capital in Auckland's neighborhood, maybe this neighborhood here, might be quite different than, let's say, a suburban area or an area further out. Each neighborhood needs to know for itself what would bring people together. Would it be a, a barbecue? Would it be a sports day? Uh, would it be the government calling it up? Would it be a church or an, a synagogue or a mosque? Would it be held at a PTA area? Or should it be held at someone's home? So I don't know enough about Auckland to tell anyone what to do in Auckland. But what we need to have, though, in these cases, we've seen the successful outcomes have been bottom-up programs that fit in a positive framework from the government. So, for example, Remo uh, in Wellington, their job in their mind is not to tell people what to do, but to give them a framework for response. So they tell them, look, when you go to the Civil Defense Center, there's no ladders there. There's no gas masks there. There's no food there. It's a meeting spot. What you do when you get there is your choice. Do you want to set up an intake place where you have people who can give help and who need help? Great, do that. Do you want to have a top-down system like the, the, the military uses, a command and control response? Feel free. Remo's job, it says, at least on paper and in my discussions with them, has been to make a framework. The local communities then fit in the gaps. So let's say you have a really strong local leader, maybe a woman who's been there for 50 years, she knows the Maori community. So she says to everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to follow the, the Maori system, we're going to meet in the Maori land, we're going to have the organization through them. Maybe in some other area in Wellington, maybe it'll be a local church, or maybe for Afghani immigrants it'll be a, a mosque. So each neighborhood needs to take control for its, own, for its own self. The dangers we've had until now is most responses, governments tend to centralize them. This is easier. It's homogenous. Whatever you did in one city, you do in the other. Whatever you fit for whatever. The, the, the problem with homogeneity is, of course, it misses the nuances of, well, maybe I don't go to a mosque. Maybe I go to a synagogue. Maybe I don't want to go to a, a civil defense area. I want to go to someone's house. So each neighborhood needs to work on its own internal cohesion and questions of what they want to do. So I, I would say if I had to spend a dollar, the dollar would be get the framework in place. Have the man emergency managers recognize what their role is. It's not to tell everyone else what to do. It's to tell them, this is how the framework is structured. What you want to do when the disaster strikes, before the disaster strikes, that's up to you. And then to build that. This is happening in, in San Francisco as well, in the community called Bayview. The first six months of meetings were people telling them, when the disaster strikes, we're not going to be here. People said, what are you talking about? We, we, we pay our taxes, why not? And they convinced them over half a year that, no, really, this is your responsibility. After that half a year went by, then the community said, okay, fine. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we get a school gym as the meeting place. We're going to organize these families as the head captains. We'll have a phone tree, an email tree. So they, they organize themselves. It took a long time to change that norm, the expectations of what they're supposed to do. So I think that the investment should be in, not in early warning systems or physical stuff, but getting in place a, a framework at the national or central level, and then the successful bottom-up building. It's a follow-up to this one. Uh, you, you said that prior to the, to the disaster in Japan, the, 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 the dominant approach Self-preparedness. Uh, self-evacuation. Uh, self-evacuation. Yeah, and, and afterwards it changed. Right. So h how does the new uh, approach kind of fit in the whole... Right. I, I wish it were a new approach. Actually, the, the, what happens is 
the training is tendenko, which means get out by yourself. Our findings are that people who saved lives and whose lives were saved didn't do that. It's more like a gap between the theory and the actual practice on the ground. So in Japan, as a, as a school kid, you'd be trained, you hear the siren, you feel the ground shaking, get up and walk out, no matter what anyone else does. Don't go back for your dog or for your camera or for your, your friends or for your parents. But what we found was that people actually did go to save those lives, or those people whose lives were saved, they had them saved by neighbors. So it's a gap between practice and theory. So the Japanese government still teaches people tendenko. If you go to any school in Japan right now, um, I've been to Tokyo a number of times, all the schools still teach, get up and save yourself. But again, what we saw on the ground was that wasn't what's actually happening. So if you're asking me, is the government happy that we found this? Not as such, no, because this goes against the training they've had. Um, if, am I happy with Tendenko? I think it's a good plan, initially, because it, it does try to cut down people going back for their pictures or going back for their iPhone or going back for their, their car, right? Those are unfortunately pretty common nowadays. But I think the data show very strongly, especially from interview data, that this is, the new, this is the norm people have on the ground. Those social ties bring them into a new activity that is hazardous. I mean, it is, I mean I'm telling you now, it is hazardous to go someone save, save someone else's life when there's a tsunami coming. You should really save yourself. But if you have to choose between your grandmother and yourself, most of us would go back for our grandmother, I think. I'm guessing most of us would, right? And that's the gap, I think, between rea training and reality, which is that just like doing, during evacuations, people who shouldn't evacuate do. In this case as well, people who shouldn't be saving lives do. Does this mean that there's a kind of divide between uh, sort of mainstreaming DRR within land use planning, as you said, about this, this case, the top left? Right. And, and the short-term preparedness thing, which is still uh, uh, top-down. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think throughout, certainly Japan's experience, since 1995, every impulse of the central government has been to centralize, to make it homogenous, to make it regular across areas. There's no differences in the way you allow for financing, for example. No local bonds are allowed. The ways you allow for planning and development. No local school systems can develop their own autonomous ways. And the, the ways you respond to local demands, which is, we have a framework in place, you have to stick with it. So yes, Japan's government, maybe not like New Zealand's, is a top-down, centralized command and control economy, command and control response. Of course, FEMA also has had this in place, right? FEMA came out of the disaster response and civil defense um, traditions in America in the 1940s, also for many years had a top-down response. And I think, again, what we're seeing is the gap between practice and theory. Please. This is a great question. I don't think I know the answer to that question. I think there has been some research on how connections among decision makers makes a difference. Uh, T. Boyne from Netherlands and a few of the people from there uh, have done a lot of work on this question of how do elites then function during a disaster. Uh, there's a lot of negative research that you can find, for example, called elite panic, which often shows that when a disaster strikes, it's people who are at the top who envision the worst about those at the bottom and therefore tend to respond with a military type strategy, like in Katrina, for example, uh, and also in, in some, some degree in Haiti as well. So we, I think there's a lot of research on that question. The challenge is that I don't think you can scale up this kind of research to say, for example, is country X or is region X resilient? Or how will it recover after disaster? I think that's almost impossible to tell. What I could tell you with accuracy would be how will neighborhood X af do afterwards? The question would be then, how do the civil responders and the disaster managers at the top handle those differences among communities? You know, maybe a good start would be for them to recognize the variation is going to happen. Some communities will be on their feet and back up it again, and some will not be. And the challenge for the, the decision makers is to figure out how do they fit into that framework? Are they going to insist on this top-down approach? Or can they communicate to each other and have faith that local, organize, local communities will have the self-organization capacity? Building that sort of sense of community 
because what had up on my research last year, I encountered this initiation uh, website started by Hawks Bay disaster mm-hmm. uh, civil defense yeah. called Neighborly, where a user of Hawks Bay region, they register a profile according to where they live on the address, right. and then you speak be the people who register around the neighborhood. Yes. And how important do you see internet and that kind of culture of play into building sort of cohesion? Were it positive or negative to you? This is great. So, so lots of thoughts. So one... We're actually beginning right now a program with a group called Next Door in America. I think you guys have a thing called Neighborly here in New Zealand. Neighborly, does that sound right? It's a geographically based Facebook, social media. So the question we have is, do these connections through social media enhance the face-to-face communication, the first responder aspect, or do they deteriorate them? So there's a mixed bag on this question. What role does internet play in disaster response? We know there's amazing things in terms of crowdsourcing for funding and information. We also know in some cases, though, there's deliberately negative information coming from the internet, so people spoofing false posts and that kind of stuff. But also we know that the reality is there's a trade-off between time you spend in front of a screen, like a phone, and time you spend with physical people. There's simply a trade-off that we see. Most of my students, when you do this survey, in in class at least, find their social social networks overlap by about 85% with their face-to-face networks, which means about 15% of your friends online, if you want to call them friends, aren't within a geographic contiguity where you are. The other 85% are, and that for me is a good sign, right? Because the reality is, when the disaster strikes, the first responders to pull bodies from rubble, to go offer food and assistance, to provide medical care, to get you out of your house, those are going to be people physically nearby. So having a friend in Tasmania is nice, but he or she can't help you, right, if there's an earthquake here in Auckland. Now, it's true in the long term, If you're raising funds, your friend in Tasmania could send in a donation, for example, or come and volunteer. But again, the reality is that the driving part of the resilience process is the immediate response from neighbors who are so close by geographically. So this is where my own concerns, let's say, play a part. I'm not a big fan, honestly, of internet uh, as a DRR response. I think it can work as a megaphone in many cases, and we've seen some good stuff in Oklahoma and other places, Kansas City, but I'm not a fan that, that during the first few days afterwards, the internet is so powerful because what we see is many of the immediate, immediate problems can't be solved by a Facebook rally and appeal for money. Those, those things take time and uh, however it's going to work. Banks aren't running anyway, right? You can't get the money out of a bank because the ATMs are down. Cell phones aren't working anyway because the batteries in the cell phone towers last for 24 hours. You have all these obstacles to a successful integration of those technologies into a real response. You saw this in Hurricane Katrina. A lot of organizations had cell phone based responses, which is a great plan if cell phones are still working. But in New Orleans, we discovered that the average American cell phone tower batteries last for 24 hours. So that's great for the first 23 hours, and then you have the even problem after that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not against using this in a, in a smart way, but I think we need a lot more research to figure out what happens. Now, in the, in the case of the geographically enabled, like a neighborly or a Facebook or the thing that you mentioned, right, that Bay thing, I think that has a lot of potential, right? Because then again, you're speaking with people who live in the light nearby. So if there's a crime wave, this is the day we're doing now, if there's a crime wave in your neighborhood, how do you respond as a neighborhood? Community watches, more patrols, you have more lights installed and so forth. Those are immediate local responses, as opposed to, let's say, you know, send us $5 because we need to crowdsource the funding for our new you know, community cruiser. So I, th- I think those kind of responses that are combining ge- geographic contiguity and also internet connections, I think that's possible to help out. This is the challenge. I think there's no, there's no panacea to get people out of their homes in many cases or off their screens. So I walked by, for example, an internet cafe yesterday and I saw some hardcore gamers in there playing, right? Playing World of Warcraft or whatever. You know, I can't imagine that you know, those individuals would be any more connected with the internet on or off. Right? They have a culture they've built together online. Right? And I'm not sure we can necessarily pull them out of that culture and say, okay, meet your neighbor on your left, here's your neighbor on your right, you know, here's your new plot captain. I, mean, I think what we can do is we can find those individuals already on the margin, right? And this is happening in San Francisco where they have a block captain and his or her job is to go to every house and every apartment in their block and build up a local database. 
So for example, we know who needs medicines for diabetes, who has animals, and who has pets, who has wheelchair access or needs wheelchair access. And then we have a few individuals in the community who do their best to prop those individuals up if there's a problem, to get, get them involved. I don't think it's possible to get everybody involved. So you know, the reality is, since most of us already are not involved, we have a huge population to work on first. We're going to have some kind of distribution where some people will never come. And some, some of your friends probably go to every meeting, right? Whatever the meeting is, they're there. They give blood, they're there. Some people, on the other hand, will never go up, no matter what you ask them to do. So we have to work with the, sort of the middle ground, where they would get involved, maybe they're hesitant, they're concerned about social cues, they don't know people very well, they're newcomers, they're only here for a year. So for that population, maybe we have more space to work and actually get them to, to engage in a face-to-face -face collaboration. Um, can we learn from, so how robust is the framework of social capital in terms of the international scale? So can we learn from, like, say, collectivist cultures um, incorporated into this? Because by definition, they could have more social capital by what social capital you would have outlined. Is that the yeah, it does. And this is the question I get a lot, which is, well, you're working in Japan, right? Can you really take the examples from Japan anywhere else? So the interesting thing is the following. Even in Japan, there's massive variation from block to block, neighborhood to neighborhood. So for example, in Japan, in, I live in Tokyo now, so in Sangenjaya in Japan versus Shirokane, these are very different cultures, different cultures of self-help and involvement. You know, some people know their neighbors, some people don't. So even in collectivist cultures where there is, let's say, a, a higher level of interest in the group than, let's say, America, nonetheless, I think we see enough variation to find that this works even there. And of course, all the more so in cultures like America, where we already have a relatively individualistic culture, which isn't based by and large on group membership, right, as a way of, of cooperation. So I think that's one thing. So yes. Then the other question is, can we learn from them? Absolutely. I mean, you know, some cultures have, I think, have done a great job of working together really well. Again, I mentioned the Vietnamese community in, in New Orleans. They ha they've been giving lectures and workshops, actually, you know, on what they did in New Orleans following the disaster there in 2005. That community, Village de l'Est, Father Dien, a lot of people have taken them as a model. And it's funny enough, they're actually relatively, they're relatively, social capital, right? They're, they're a relatively connected community, but through a church, actually. So a lot of the churches in New Orleans now have been using Father Diem and MQVN as a model for what they can do. And of course, they're not Vietnamese, the other churches are not, but they're taking them as a model. So I think it's, it's absolutely possible to learn across cultures and across institutions to see what have been the best practices. I think the danger right now is, because many of, many of our, our responses are typically top-down and infrastructure-based, even the concept of integrating social capital just sounds too flimsy and ambiguous and, and like cotton candy. You know, how do we really do this? How do we measure this? You know, in Japan, it's funny, I'm talking to you from Japan's example, they're spending $2.1 billion right now on new seawalls. Our data from our research we just published showed those had no impact at all on mortality, zero. No seawall that we could measure reduced mortality. But all the money being spent right now on disaster recovery processes, mitigation, it's all in seawalls. So here we have this huge gap between what we're finding empirically as social scientists and what's actually being done. So I think absolutely, yes, we can learn from collective cultures. There's a lot of space to change policy areas. And of course, we can take best practices from individual examples. Maybe first and then, yeah. So uh, two things. One, I would say it's, it's difficult to talk about a city as a whole uh, because primarily city level recoveries don't happen. It's a neighbor by neighbor neighbor. What I do know from empirical research being done by people like Susan Valance, for example, is that there are neighborhoods outside the officially designated CBD area in the north and northwest corridor. They have a lot of organic growth and market growth. People are coming in there, businesses are moving there in the short term. And that's not within, let's say, the official let's rebuild zone in the CBD, the red zone areas. So there's a gap right now in, in Christchurch and Canterbury between policies encouraging building in the CBD and the actual organic market growth. Right? And I say this is a good example uh, that we see where oftentimes we have a plan in place. It's pretty homogenous. It's, it's based on feedback or whatever. We begin the plan and we recognize people aren't doing the same thing. They're doing something different. Uh, and I, I think we saw that here as well. New Orleans tried to shut down certain neighborhoods and say, we'll have a smaller footprint. Right? This was the green dot map incident. Uh, in Broadmere, for example. Several of these neighborhoods 
had a map made of them and they had green dots there. And the citizens asked, so what, what do these green dots mean? They're told, well, we're going to let your community just grow back the grass. We're not letting you move back. We're, we're going to let the trees and the forest grow back as a catchment for future disasters. And citizens said, no, I don't think so. And you had this massive fight and eventually citizens built there anyway. So we saw this big gap between a top-down centralized planning from the BYBOB, bringing back New Orleans Commission, and what was actually happening. So I, what I've heard, at least about Canterbury and Christchurch, is a similar approach. There's a top-down plan. It's in place already. We see variation on that plan that's happening. The challenge now is to integrate, just like we talked before about the different frameworks, to integrate what's actually happening on the ground, the organic growth, the bottom-up growth, with the expectations for growth that have been put in place by a central planner. Please. In Christchurch as well, at the time, they also red zoned the whole area so no communities can actually get into the CBA. So that would have encouraged immediate uh, volunteer support in the outlying suburbs as well. Right. Something we do in New Zealand is um, isolate and don't let anyone in. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Rena disaster, we um, put restrictions on all the beaches in the area, mm -hmm. and volunteer groups found it very difficult to get onto those beaches to clean up. Right. This is what they wanted to do originally. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of weeks later when, they, uh, when the council funnel clicked on mm -hmm. that they started inviting the groups onto the beaches to help clean up with the proper equipment and, and gear to do so. Yeah. I mean, Kobe tried this in 1995 as well. Kobe had a moratorium on all growth. So they had a massive earthquake. 8,000 people were killed. And they said no growth can happen until we have planning meetings. What was interesting there was they weren't top-down planning meetings. They sent architects to each neighborhood, and each neighborhood was responsible for building its own plan internally. And they waited until every neighborhood had their plan, and then they said, okay, we'll take plan A, B, C, D, and put them all together into a master plan. That took a lot more time than, for example, organic growth would have or top-down approach. But then people were much more satisfied about being in that place and much more efficacious. They thought, they thought that their impact was being felt and being heard. That had a big difference in people and people coming back. What we're seeing right now in Tohoku, for example, is because of these top-down plans, building seawalls, relocating entire villages, the recovery rate is very slow. I didn't talk about population so much yet, but what we found is in some communities, fewer than one in five people want to come back at this point. It's been four and a half years. Some of the years haven't been built at all. The longer there's uncertainty about the future, and the more their friends tell them, hey, you know, I'm, I've got a new thing going on. Come move next to me. We've got a new village we're building. We've got come to this big city already built. You've got customers there already. So in those cases, the more uncertainty about the future, the less likely you are to see immediate move backs. This has been happening already in the four and a half years in Tohoku. So it can be a challenge how to use that, that moment of silence, that moratorium, to get people to then step forward into the breach and say, this is our vision of the future. I think there's a lot of work um, by Rajib Shah uh, of Kyoto University. He's argued that when citizens have a say in the future planning for their area, they want to come back to the area. When they're shut out of the zone, when they feel it's opaque, they don't really have a voice, then they feel less excited about coming back. And what we want people to feel, this is my neighborhood, this is where I'm, I belong, this is my connections that I have. When we can generate those kind of feelings or at least reconnect them, then I think we've got a better chance of getting people back in. Right, and that's a big thing, right? For parents especially, when a lot of their activities, you know, a stay-at-home parent, female or male, a lot of their activities revolve around the school, getting kids to school, afternoon meetings, PTA, right? Shutting a school down is a, is a sign. In Tohoku, that was the first priority, actually. The central government said our top priority is getting schools reopened so that kids can feel like their rhythms of life have been reestablished for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's time-consuming, it's messy, it doesn't have a guaranteed outcome. You know, in some communities along the coast, they still haven't agreed. Do we relocate the entire community, only some of the community? Do we stay here in a vulnerable area because we expect it'll be a long time before the next disaster? They're still hashing these debates out. You know, that's taking a lot more time than just, okay, we're building now, we're not building now. So yeah, it, it takes time, it, it's, it's messier. And of course, it also, to some degree, requires trust. You have to trust the citizens to make the right decision. Oftentimes, I think we decision makers often don't have that trust in citizens. There's a great uh, work by. Power at stake. Yes, there's power at stake. Exactly. You know, why would I devolve power to a local government or a local authority or a local planning commission 
when we really have what we think of as the ideal process, right, which has a CBD, it has certain industries going in, we have funds for university or not. So I think, I think that's the challenge for all of us to figure out, you know, in, especially in democratic societies, whether it's New Zealand or America or Japan, how do we balance the expertise at the top, the technocracy, right, people who think they know what's going on, where the, those are those who have to live in the plan. This happened in New Orleans. A number of the people I was there at these meetings, local residents would say to the planner, when you finish planning our community, are you going to live here? And the planners would say, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from New York. And the citizens like, then why would I trust you to do anything with my work? This happened a number of times that I was there, especially in, broad, in broad, uh, Broadmoor. The citizens said, we want people who will be living in the community they build. When you design it, it should be your responsibility to stay here. So some of the smarter communities actually moved in. Some of the architects from New York literally bought a house in the community. That was one response. Um, but other ones admitted that, you know, their job was to come in, do their job, and get out again. And that's, that's the danger. We want to make sure that's the long term. I should also point out, by the way, that a lot of the thinking that we have for these recovery processes is often short term, right? So how are we spending next year's budget? How are we getting schools on? You know, the reality is New Orleans has been over 10 years, 10 years since 2005, and most people would say there are still areas that are not yet recovered a decade later in a very, very wealthy country uh, that certainly has had no shortages of planning and preparation and FEMA and Red Cross involvement. So, you know, we had to think about the recovery process, not as a one-year or five-year process, but I think as a, as a 10-plus-year process. We saw this also in the, in the 1920s in Tokyo. The recovery of the city took over a decade before people could really say, yes, now, now the rhythms of life are reestablished, we have schools, businesses, and repopulation. It's not a one- or two-year process. And, of course, political cycles often are one or two or three or four years, much shorter than the actual recovery cycle it is. So how do you sync, let's say, the political cycle of spending money, maybe in ways that don't necessarily help everyone but are visible, to the long-term planning, which doesn't have the sexy front page headline qualities, but might be much more important for daily life. Maybe one more question? Yeah, changing topic, uh, and this is the provocative question of someone who doesn't do quantitative research, uh, but who was convinced by what you presented, but are you sure you haven't missed any uh, important variables? <laughs> right. Yeah, this is a great thing. We're never sure. I mean, I think anyone who would tell you that they have it all is, is deluding themselves. We'll never really know how we do things. So what we try to do in this research was, let's say, triangulate. So do the interviews on the ground, talk to people who are there, measure what we can measure, see if it fits the stories that we have, and then, then go back and forth. So for us, it was a really nice coming together when we had the narratives of people who survived and survivors who helped them combined with the data that these seem to matter a lot. We could be missing something, right? Maybe we're missing education levels. Uh, maybe we're missing long-term investments. That's true. And this is micro data, right? So we don't even know across Japan how different are these cities on the west coast or the north. But I think the good thing for us is it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative research. So we can try and figure out, do we have the right narrative? Do we have the right things to measure? And then can we go back and forth between the two? So I would never be so as insane as to claim that this is the last word. I think what I always want to do is figure out what can we do for one step forward? And then how does that fit with the kind of data that we have on the ground? I think it's important to have that kind of quantitative kind of backup as well, because right. most of the evidence so far for, I mean, pushing for a community-based kind of uh, initiative has been based on qualitative or participatory kind of approaches. So right. it's good to have something from a different perspective as well. I think for, merging with right. I think for us, I mean, the World Bank paper that we wrote is a really cool thing. We have 150 interviews with people involved in the project, plus overtime data analysis. And we can merge those really, really well. So you know, the average person who comes to this meeting, here's what they're like. The person who doesn't come, here's what they're like. And here's the different narratives they have. And here's how we see this on the broader pattern scale. So I think that, that for us is a great model for, for social science research. Yeah, the bank should be happy about having numbers and figures for yes. large data sets. Now we're taking them to pay us because they haven't quite given us the tranche of money yet. But yes, we're, we're getting toward that moment right now. Any further questions? Yeah. I kind of missed this earlier, my apologies if I did, but are you seeing, I guess, um, people's emotional state or maybe, I guess, you know, level of depression and anxiety stress changing over time? The day is like the first day is the right. Yeah, this is a great question. And this is the, the paper we have at The Lancet right now, which is tracking over time, especially people who've been through the nuclear disaster. How does their mental health status change? So the, it's a lot of bad news, actually. That paper is a lot of bad news, unfortunately. Uh, and the bad news is individuals who lived near the nuclear power plant, or even within 50 kilometers of the nuclear power plant, have much higher, measurably higher, 
stress levels. So we ask them questions from the Kessler Index. How are you sleeping these days? What's your anxiety about the future? Does your stomach hurt a lot? Those kind of questions. So their answers indicate people who have been through what they think is exposure to radiation have far higher levels of PTSD, sleeplessness, insomnia, anxiety. Individuals who just went through the disaster have lower but measurably higher levels than the average person, and then those have fluctuated over time. The nice thing about the findings, the only good news we could find, was that basically what happened is, as people have more connections, as their ne social network either grows or is maintained at least from their olden days, those, are, those stress levels are slightly lowered, measurably lowered. So for example, someone who has about five or six friends from the old country who's moved a lot and is worried, they're about as equally mentally stressed as someone who didn't go through nuclear power disaster and just went through the disaster by itself, the tsunami and earthquake disasters. So in that sense, social capital is a shield, let's say, against mental anxiety. So yeah, we have seen very high uh, mental anxiety among Fukushima evacuees, uh, especially parents, by the way, that's the highest stress levels that we've seen, because of course, no one really knows, despite assurances from the government about radiation levels, no one can tell you right now, well, it'll be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 or 30 years. And because of that dread risk, the unknown risks, therefore we've seen really, really high levels of stress. Yes. So we've actually, we haven't seen that. So we, we did test for that question. You know, was it possible that the disaster itself broke apart bonds? So what we found was even people separated by distance or by the disaster maintain many of those bonds. And this is, this is the time when things like, we've actually encouraged towns to have reunions of their town, even if the town has been scattered across most of Japan right now. We've encouraged the town and government itself to hold reunions, just to bring people back together on a regular basis. And if you've ever seen an old friend from school, that kind of weird connection you have, you haven't seen them for 25 years, but all of a sudden you're talking about whatever is in common still. So we have found that the disaster itself didn't damage those. In fact, there's a book by Rebecca Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T, called A Paradise Made in Hell. And she argues that actually these kind of disasters increase solidarity and cohesion. She says going through a negative experience, like a Christchurch disaster or a Tohoku disaster, makes you feel connected to people who also had the same uh, stressful event. And she argues actually over time that's an imp increase. Uh, we haven't seen that much of an increase, but certainly we haven't seen the breaking apart of those bonds either. One last question. I was just gonna ask, uh, I work a lot in sort of infrastructure resilience stuff, and I agree 100% with your comments about the, the sort of the way everybody in government are trying to focus solely on that. And to the end, that there's a lot of these measurement frameworks that are coming out of the UN yeah, and seen that. Rockefeller trying to measure yeah. levels of resilience across cities and um, right. yeah and I think they're, they're largely ignoring what you're saying. Uh, have you had any correspondence with the UN and Rockefeller groups about this stuff? Uh, uh, cover my mic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes I have. And it's, it's been a mixed bag. Uh, I've, I've argued very strongly that you cannot talk about a resilient city. It makes no sense in the same way that you can see, right, that the patterns of recovery are so dependent on micro-level causes. To talk about a city being resilient to a disaster, I, I even saw a framework at a country level. You know, is Afghanistan more resilient than Iraq? Right, that was their attempt to compare the two. And you can imagine who's planning that, that study, right? But in, in any case, I think it's, it's a pushback that we have to do and say, you know, it's very convincing to, peop to tell a decision maker, your city is an A and your community nearby is a B, right? That's good, good to hear, but the reality is that's not how the recovery is going to work if there's, a, if there's a disaster. That's not how casualties will happen, that's not how vulnerability happens, it's not at a city level. So yes, I've had a lot of discussions with the Rockefeller Resilient Cities people and also with the World Bank. I think it's, it's our job as scholars and residents to tell them, you know, these frameworks are a great start. They're focusing on this question of resilience. Fantastic, great start. Now let's sort of build down. We need the cities themselves to say, where are the neighborhoods in our community that we think are socially, social capitally and physically vulnerable? How do we deal with those? Susan Cutter, for example, in, in South Carolina does a lot of this work. How do we think about not a city level framework, but a block level framework or neighborhood framework? And that's, just, that's for the local responders, right? You should know if you have a huge block of area that's unconnected, that's what you should be sending the supplies first. This is the area you should be building community development activities, encouraging more churches, more schools, whatever is to form in those areas. So that's the kind of work that we should be doing, not necessarily giving you a scorecard. Like, you know, congratulations, Rio de Janeiro is 100, and New York, New York City is a 65. Right, go back to work, exactly. <laughs>